Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. The sound of a well-made bell somehow resonates with the human heart. Santa stands for everything that's good, and that's what Coca-Cola wanted to be associated with. There are people who care. There are people who want to make a difference. Today on Spotlight, why St. Louis has a big connection to Santa Claus and the way he looks today. Plus, a preview of the Art Museum's Kwanzaa programming returning as an in-person event this year. And then they call her the storyteller of Christmas. Meet a woman who's created Hallmark movies. But first, bells in this country and their connection to a St. Louis bell company. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. The Sound of Bells is the soundtrack of life. We ring in a new year, a new nation. We celebrate new life and mark one well lived. Bells are part of our pop culture. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. And commerce. In 400 AD, bells first rang in monasteries. They were made by monks to call people to worship. In Europe during the 15th and 16th century, the first mechanical clocks were built in church towers. They told time by striking bells. Today that tradition continues in church towers all across America. One of the oldest, founded in 1855 in Baltimore, Maryland, is the McShane Bell Company. Of some 200 bell foundries in America, McShane is one of just a few that still exist today. So this bell's uh, from 1898. Meet James Andrewe. Five years ago, he bought the McShane Bell Company and moved it here to St. Louis, Missouri. I started working uh, with my father at 10 years old. We, he built clocks and then the opportunity to buy McShane came up and it was, it was something I couldn't turn down. So that was the next step in, in the process because clocks and bells are synonymous. They go hand in hand. At one time, St. Louis was the hub of bell casting. There were 37 foundries between 1821 and 1961. The Mississippi River steamboats, as well as the railroad, transported bells east and west. Being out of St. Louis allows us to get coast to coast within three hours. His mission, James says, is to keep the bells ringing. Throughout the world, there are some 100,000 bells inscribed with the McShane name. They are found in church towers, courthouses, and schools. I'm in it to continue the tradition of bells and making them function. A very large number of them survive because bells don't wear out. The equipment that hangs them, that rings them, that wears out and has to be replaced. But bells themselves will last forever. And the sound that they make rings for a long time. Carl Zimmerman is a campanologist. A campanologist is defined as one who studies bells. And boy, does he know bells. The biggest bell that McShane made, we think, was about 10,000 pounds. We have altogether eight books of bell records from the McShane Bell Foundry Company. So what this is good for now is that if someone comes in and wants to find out the history of a bell, we can look back here. Chicago, Philadelphia, Buffalo, New York, six bells. To Whatcom in the Western Territory, which hadn't become a state yet. This is a clock tower that's going to have a bell. This is going to Willard, Ohio. So we're building it, and they have an original McShane bell. This one was sold to us by a private individual and this one will be refurbished, and it is going to Santa's Village in Canada. One 
One of the oldest church bell towers in St. Louis is St. Vincent de Sales. The church built in 1904 has four bells, one from the original church built in 1867. James and the McShane Bell Company maintain these bells as they ring every 15 minutes except at night. So we have 25 bells. Uh, these are chromatically tuned and the way to tune them is to put them on a lathe and slowly start from the bottom and work your way out and take chips out of them. So we call it making chips. So this is the way you get the note. So right here, we have three different notes. The bells, when put together, become a musical instrument of sort. Four or five bells make a clock chime. Eight to 15, what's called an American chime. And 23 to 77 bells is a carillon. There are 190 carillons in North America, including one right here in St. Louis. Concordia Seminary houses 49 bells in Luther Tower, and inside is a carillon keyboard. Yes, Carl the Campanologist is also a carillonist. He's playing the keyboard in a carillon. He learned to play while an undergrad in college. I love the pipe organ. I played the piano. I, in the past, I played flute and piccolo. I've enjoyed them all, but the bells are the instrument of my heart. John Klinger is the chief information officer for the seminary. He also plays the carillon. He noticed when he was hired back in 2007, nobody was playing the bells. So he asked if he could practice. And soon... We were playing the bells once a week. For me to practice and for everyone to hear the bells finally ringing and listening to the hymns again. Then during COVID, a series of concerts called Hems for Hope kept the bells ringing through the pandemic. It is the heart that seems to connect with the ringing of bells striking a chord that triggers shared memories and hope. Part of it, I think, is that, that the sound of a bell doesn't just ring and quit. It rings and then it fades away. So you hear it for a period of time and the sound of a well-made bell somehow resonates with the human heart. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Hi, I'm Aaron Lane from Bass Tire, Santa's favorite local tire store. Every Christmas, Santa makes a fortune, helping businesses make their fortune by appearing in their ads. No wonder he's so jolly. But of all the ads Santa has appeared in over the years, the iconic image of the chubby, merry, grandfatherly Santa we have today was created by an advertising agency based in St. Louis, working for a company based in Atlanta. The agency was Darcy Advertising, and the company was Coca-Cola. Darcy had the Coke account from 1906 to 1955. Before, uh, Darcy came out with this ad. Santa was depicted as a rather stern uh, character. With uh, he was he was uh, rather thin and uh, garbed in uh, sort of a brown uniform. Darcy began using Santa in Coca-Cola's advertising in the 1920s. This ad, drawn in 1930 by an artist named Fred Meisen depicted a department store Santa, enjoying the pause that refreshes at what was then the world's largest soda fountain, located in the famous bar department store in downtown St. Louis. But the following year is when the enduring image of the actual Santa was created by an artist named Haddon Sunbloom, who also created the look of other iconic advertising characters, including the Quaker Oats Man. The mastermind behind the Coca-Cola campaign was Darcy's Archie Lee, who was the St. Louis-based account executive in charge of Coke. I don't think it's you know, known very widely at all. Um, 
And I don't know. I mean, I, I've often wondered whether or not I really want to know that the Santa that my kids love, that I loved, was created by an advertising uh, firm trying to sell me a soft drink. <laughs> Haddon Sunbloom drew Santa for Coca-Cola from 1931 to 1964, 33 years. At first, Sunbloom had used one of his neighbors as the model. But when that man died, after some reflection, Sunbloom started using his own face. The rest of Santa's look was truly pure poetry. He just followed the uh, description that was in Twas the Night Before Christmas. and. Uh, created a quite jolly old elf. And that was the image that America came to love. And I guess the rest of the world came to love after that. Oh my gosh, you couldn't find a more iconic character to be seen with your product. I mean, it was brilliant. Santa stands for everything that's good. And that's what Coca-Cola wanted to be associated with. And being associated with Coca-Cola was also good for Darcy. Their success with Coke helped the St. Louis-based agency land another beverage account. It was just uh, amazing to think that this company in St. Louis was competing with some of the biggest agencies in the country. It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Darcy would go on to give us many more memorable ads and characters. But today, Darcy itself is just a memory. It was acquired by a French firm in 2002, which closed the office in St. Louis and retired the Darcy name. But thanks to Darcy's creativity, the world will always share a thirst for Santa. Advertising is really a mirror of our culture at the time. And, you know, it's, it sometimes uh, is just a flash in the pan where you see an ad or a commercial and you, you instantly identify with it because it's reflecting you. And some last years or even decades like the, like the Haddon Sunbloom ad for Coca-Cola. Looking for St. Louis centric videos to use in your classroom? Check out our educational resources at educate.today. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Jack Frost nipping at your nose Yuletide carols being sung by a choir And folks dressed up like Eskimos Everybody knows a turkey and some mistletoe Will help to make the Seasons bright, tiny tides with their eyes all aglow. We'll find it hard to sleep tonight. They know that Santa's on his way, he's loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh. And every mother's child is gonna spy To see if a reindeer really know how to fly And so I'm offering this simple phrase To kids from one to ninety-two been said many times, many ways, Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. 
We are here at the St. Louis Art Museum in the Farrell Auditorium, where on December 31st at 10 a.m., we look forward to welcoming you back here in person for our annual Kwanzaa celebration. The Kwanzaa event is a celebration of family culture education. It started with the St. Louis Art Museum about 24 years ago in partnership with our chapter, and it has been an amazing celebration each year. This year's celebration is back in person after two years being virtual. We are so excited to welcome families back into the St. Louis Art Museum. We'll be coming together to have activities for our youth as well as celebrating family and culture. With drummers, dancing, singing, and celebration of the seven principles of Kwanzaa. We celebrate Kwanzaa to set aside time when our families can get together and experience culture. It's a time when families come together and have a feast. They make handmade gifts for each other. They talk about self-determination. We support Black-owned businesses during this time, and we explain purpose during this time. You understand your purpose and creativity during this time. When you're here on December 31st, there's a lot of exciting activities going on outside of the performance that will be happening here in the auditorium. We also have art making from 10 to 2. Inspired by one of our objects in the collection, you're able to make a beaded crown. We have a family-friendly photo booth where you're able to showcase those crowns and a scavenger hunt that really engages all of the different principles of Kwanzaa found throughout works of art. The St. Louis Art Museum is a museum for the community and we are really excited to welcome everyone who is part of the St. Louis community as a way to elevate the human spirit and inspire discovery. Events like these are so important to be able to connect with different cultural heritages and really honor everyone in our community. For more information regarding this in-person celebration, please visit www.slam.org. Music from the 442s later on Spotlight. You only have one room. Yeah, we're fully booked. Only a fool wants to drive in this weather. You know those Hallmark Channel movies that just put you in the Christmas spirit? I'm just here to help you save Christmas. You can thank the official storyteller of Christmas, Debbie Maycumber, for many of them. And I want to give them something that's going to make them feel good and make them uh, want to um, what's that? give them inspiration and hope that they could find that same kind of happiness themselves. You'll find that common theme not just in Debbie May Cumber's Christmas novels turned movies, but in most of her many books. Over her 40-year career, she's written everything from romance novels to children's books. And now she even has her own magazine. You've been given the nickname of the official storyteller of Christmas. Is that true? Have you heard that? Yeah, I've heard that. Yes. Yes. I love Christmas. And why have you written so many books about Christmas? I think Christmas is just such a special time of year. It seems like our hearts are more open and there is a feeling of goodwill towards men. And, you know, it's, it's just a joyous time. And yet we put all put so many pressures on ourselves. So I decided I wanted to write a book that my readers could sit down and just relax and enjoy a real Christmas story every year. Do you have any of your novels that are being turned into Hallmark Channel movies? Uh, well, I have five of them that are optioned. So we'll, you know, who knows? Right. Well, because you've already had five that have turned into a movie, right? Yeah, Is it five? something like that, yeah. And are you involved in any way? Do you go on the set or does that all happen outside of, of what you do? Almost every movie I have been up to the set of, and my uh, kids have been in the scenes. They don't have any speaking parts. I had a, a speaking part in one of the Cedar Cove episodes. What is that like to, to be on the set? I'm sure they're not exactly the way yeah. that you saw them. Not at all. But my husband have, has a very succinct way of making me understand if I have any quabbles or quibbles. And he says, the check cleared. <laughs> <laughs> to see the full interview with the official storyteller of Christmas, visit hecmedia.org. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated. 
honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Twas a few months before Christmas in Santa's warehouse. The elves were busy wrapping and wrapping and wrapping some more. No, these aren't North Pole elves. They're St. Louis Santa's Helpers. Santa's Helpers, Inc., to be exact, a nonprofit group that's been around for over 50 years. I am the executive director of Santa's Helpers, Inc., which takes care of thousands of children every Christmas and hundreds of children for Christmas in July with homeless kids. Founder Rita Sweener started the idea after adopting a family as a student at UMSL. So it started one family, and then it went to five, then it went to 10, then it went to 15, then it went to 20, and it's just growing and growing and growing. Last year, they provided gifts on Christmas for 1,132 families. Some of the families have 12 children in them. A lot of them have six or eight children in them. And each child doesn't just get one gift, they get six. Every child gets at least three books. Then they, if they ask for clothes, they get a full outfit and then they get toys. And we are, so far we've been able to pretty much fill every wish list. The multiple gift idea is Rita's, carried over from a childhood experience. Well, I spent time in an orphanage when I was six years old and they came around saying, what do you want? And I said, I want a doubt open closest size. And then I thought about it and I got a bed ran back down. I said, and I want a nurse's kit. And they looked at me and said, don't be greedy, pick one. And I couldn't decide which one. I finally did pick the Dow, but I really wanted the nurse's kit too. And so now our kids don't have to pick one. They get six toys. Toys are dropped off or donated through their Amazon and Walmart wish lists. They're also purchased thanks to donations. And Rita is a woman who knows how to find a deal. I've been trained for 54 years at Morgan Shop. In October of 2019, Governor Parson proclaimed it to be Santa's Helpers Inc. Month. I never knew it would get this big for one family. It was just an idea I had to do. Each family's gifts are bagged and picked up by social workers who refer them. Each bag represents one family. These feet get a lot of steps walking up and down the aisles. I am now 80 years old. And let's see, I started in 68, so I was 27 years old. She says her work is too important to ever quit. A young girl, about 10 years old, she was at one of the homeless places we did. And the social worker was telling us she can go in the room, Santa's going to call their names, give them presents. And a little girl with defiance in her eyes looked at Santa and said, Santa don't know my name. I'm nobody. I'm homeless. Santa called her name. She grabbed the teddy bear out of Santa's arms and looked at the tag herself. Big smile went on her face. She ran to the social worker and said, you're right, you're right. I am a somebody. He knew my name. So the generosity of Santa's helpers makes some of the kids know they are a somebody. They are important. It's a nonprofit bringing the Christmas spirit to kids who need it most. It has taught me that there are generous people out there. There are people who care. There are people who want to make a difference. There are people who want these kids to know that they're important, that they're not defined by the fact they're in poverty, that they're really loved. Love that started with Rita over 50 years ago. The founder, who by the way, doesn't even celebrate Christmas herself. No, I am Jewish. I am the Jewish Santa. For more information, head to santashelpersstl.com. Christmas without you I'll be so blue 
just thinking about you Decorations of red on an old green Christmas tree Won't be the same, dear, if you're not here with me And when those blue snowflakes start falling That's when those blue memories start calling We'll be doing all right with the Christmas of white. But I have a blue, 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 blue Christmas. Cardinal Glenn and Kids' Attitude of Grace inspired a book. Plus, if your New Year's resolution is to get fit, we have a story that can help. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.